الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد الشاكرين المعترفين بأنعمه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد يا ربنا أنت خالق السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد أنت فاطر السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد أنت قيوم السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن لك الحمد فأنت الحق ووعدك حق ولقاؤك حق والجنة حق والنار حق ومحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم حق لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة لنا إلا بك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صلي وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endlessly is in his glory the creator of heavens and earth the cherisher, the provider, the sustainer the source of bounties, the source of good, the source of guidance I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings that he has granted me and my loved ones and I express my gratitude to the Lord in words and in action I say alhamdulillah for blessings I know and blessings I'm unaware of I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, the role model to be followed. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I thank Allah for the blessing that is Muhammad. And I thank Allah for making us among the followers of Muhammad, for keeping us straight on the path of Muhammad, for helping us walk in the footsteps of Muhammad. And I ask Allah to extend his blessings to Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and the companions of Muhammad and all men and women that walk in the footsteps. And I ask Allah to extend those blessings to each and every one of us as well. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Eid Mubarak to each and every one of you. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have blessed you with the most beautiful Eid break. I ask Allah to have accepted our good deeds, our acts of worship, our acts of devotion, our acts of obedience in the blessed month of Ramadan. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will grant us another opportunity to witness Ramadan inshallah of next year. And that we will be forgiven in that Ramadan. And there will be so many Ramadans ahead inshallah in which we will enjoy the blessings of Allah upon each and every one of us, our families and loved ones. Allahumma ameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a statement about Adam alayhi salam in the Qur'an that always shakes me to the core when I read it. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ عَهِدْنَا لِآدَمَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَنَسِي وَلَمْ نَجْدِ لَهُ عَزْمَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the translation of this ayah, like I said, makes a characterization of Adam alayhi salam that is really troubling. In which Allah says, I have commanded Adam before, but he forgot and we did not find in him strong determination. Let me repeat that. This is Allah describing his own creation. This is not us judging each other. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making a statement about us. He says that I have commanded Adam, meaning I have told Adam, do not touch this tree in the garden. You remember the story. Uh, and I expected him to follow the command, but Adam forgot. He forgot his obligations. He forgot what he was supposed to do. And I did not find him to be of strong determination. Essentially, brothers and sisters, and, and this is why the, the statement of Allah scares me, is that this is not just a statement. This is not just a statement about Adam alayhi salam. It is a statement about the rest of us. This is a statement about humanity. It's a statement about, uh, you know, the sons and daughters of Adam, which includes pretty much every single one of us. 
If I make a statement about you and I say, you know, you're not strong-willed or you don't have determination, you will take it with a grain of salt. You know, some people will say, well, you know, the, the imam has a point. Somebody else will say, well, you know, you're wrong. We can argue when we make statements about each other. But when the statement comes from the Creator about us, there's no argument there. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created us and He knows exactly how we are and He knows what we're capable of. So when the Creator says you're weak, and you don't have strong will, and you don't have strong determination in you, you really ought to take that very, very seriously. Now, I don't want you to understand these words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as prohibitive either. He's not trying to trim your feathers. He's not trying to break your wings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not trying to tell you you're doomed, you're weak, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. He's just pointing your attention to a predisposition that exists in you. He's pointing your attention to a weakness that exists within you. And he's trying to tell you, you need to exert effort, you need to work hard in order to overcome this particular tendency, this particular weakness. So essentially what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have created a weakness in you, and that is your trial, that is your tribulation, and you need to work as hard as possible in order to overcome it. That makes me feel just a little bit better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear to me what my weakness is, so that I can put more effort and plan to overcome that particular weakness. And this is really important to talk about, especially as we bid farewell to the month of Ramadan. Because in Ramadan, we have given Allah our covenant. We have made Him a promise in Ramadan. We asked Him to forgive us. We asked Him to reset our records. We asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wipe our slates clean. We've demanded things of Allah and He granted them in the month of Ramadan. We promised Allah that we're going to change our lifestyles. We promised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're going to be strong and stable on the path. We promised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're going to be better throughout the rest of the year. That is our covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is important right now to talk about that tendency in us to forget like Adam alayhi salam did. And as we move away from the month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, I want to show you that the parallel between us and Adam and between the story of Ramadan and the garden actually goes a lot deeper than you think. And let me show you this. The parallel between the garden in which Adam السلام, disobeyed Allah goes and, and our experience with the month of Ramadan as our garden goes a lot deeper than that. And I want to show you, you know, how that is. So uh, pay attention to this. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibit Adam from that particular tree? What was unique about that particular tree? Is it the case that there was a, a, an apple tree and a peach tree and a guava tree and a mango tree and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked one particular fruit and he told Adam, do not eat from this? No. The trees were actually identical to each other. They all yielded the same fruit. And Allah picked one that resembles every single other tree in every quality. And he said to Adam, do not eat from this tree. In fact, had the tree been different from the other trees, Adam would have been less curious. He would have said, you know what, maybe Allah prevented me from this particular tree because it has bitter taste. It's unhealthy for me. He would have had some type of rationalization in order to understand why this particular tree is prohibited. But the reality is that, and this is what made Adam very curious, is that this tree was just like all the other trees. It resembles the other trees. Very, very same exact thing. Same exact fruit, same exact taste, same exact look, same exact smell, all of it. And that's why he was very curious. Why that one in particular? What is so unique? What is the secret of this tree? It looks like all the other trees. What is the secret of this tree? And I ask you, this applies actually to a lot of other prohibitions in our lives. I can rationalize with you about why eating pork is haram. And, and, and probably if you look at all the prohibitions in Islam, if you look at theft or murder or, you know, fornication or drinking alcohol or, you know, doing drugs or God knows what, you know, slander, lying, all the things that Allah prohibited us, there is a way to make a strong rational argument about why this is good for us, right? I can go through that exercise. But at some point, you need to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a command 
and you just need to comply with the command of Allah and to, and to say سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We listen and obey. And that was the test to Adam السلام, and the test that we often experience. And, and I've spoken on this pulpit before. It is not healthy for us to constantly try to find rationalization behind the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not healthy. Sometimes you'll manage to do that when it's very obvious, such as murder or alcohol is bad for your health. And sometimes you, you, you won't understand it. You know? Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you need to pray Maghrib three rakahs? Why not four? Why not two? Why is it that we need to fast in the month of Ramadan from this hour to that hour? Why Ramadan and not Shawwal? Like why is it halal to eat on the days of Sha'ban and Rajab, but it is haram to eat on the days of Ramadan? You will not be able to find the good rationalization every single time you ask that question. And I advise you to make it a habit to just comply with the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this essentially is the meaning of taslim. Our theme in Ramadan this year was to surrender with submission to the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal. To find it in your heart to just do it. If Allah says so, then it has to be done. I don't need to understand why. I honestly don't even care. And that was the test to Adam. Don't eat from this tree. And there's no apparent reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited him from eating from that tree. And Adam was supposed to just say, you know, I listen and obey. Sami'tu wa Allah said, don't touch it, I, I won't touch it. But Adam, just like curious, like the rest of us, he tries to find rationalism. I actually think that Adam tasted from the tree because he was just very curious. I'm just wondering, what is the difference between this tree and all the other trees? He was trying to find rationalization. What is the reasoning behind the prohibition? So the first, the first thing that I want us to be reminded of today so that we don't make Adam's mistake and to forget, as Allah says, and to lose our determination is to just surrender to the commands of Allah throughout the rest of the year without necessarily finding a reason. You don't have to have a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have to provide you with any reasons. You are a tiny little dust speck in his universe. Why do you think that you deserve any reasons? Why do I think that I deserve any reasons? The creator of heavens and earth needs to explain to me why I need to comply with his commands. That doesn't make any sense. Ramadan teaches us the idea of to sleep, surrender, right? But again, the parallel goes a little bit deeper than that. Adam salam was in this beautiful garden. And Allah commanded him to refrain from the permissible. That was not haram tree. It was another tree that was permissible to eat from. But he commanded him to refrain from the permissible because he needed to develop a certain type of discipline, a moral compass that he can use and lead his life with this moral compass throughout the rest of his journey. And that's why I get mad sometimes at some brothers or sisters who think that Ramadan is the end. And the day of Eid, it, I, my, my job is complete now. Now I need to go back to my normal, my regular life. Ramadan, just like the garden of Adam, Ramadan was the training ground. Ramadan was the platform that helps you develop, number one, the surrender, the needed surrender, the taslim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, and most importantly, the discipline to live by a certain code for the rest of the year. To have a particular moral compass that helps you make decisions. So I don't want you to think of the month of Ramadan as something that is over now and back to my normal life. No. Ramadan was the stepping stone that helps you continue to go up the staircase. You're not supposed to take the first step and then go down again. Ramadan was the first step in the staircase and you're supposed to go where from here? Up. The journey only begins now. Ramadan is not the end of it. Ramadan was actually the beginning of the journey. Why do we lose sight of all of this? Why do we forget like Adam forgot? I said earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Adam forgot the command and he did not have strong determination. Right? Why do we forget? I say we forget because we are filled with pride. We are filled with pride. What does that mean? Ramadan, we've come to the masjid. We've fasted, we've refrained from food and water and all kinds of things. People who smoke, they stopped smoking. You know, people who are in a haram relationship, they, they put it on hold or, you know, broke it up altogether. You know, people wanted, tried, actually tried to make structural changes in their lives in the month of Ramadan. 
And then they look back at their experience and they say, look at me. I did pretty well, didn't I? I did pretty awesome this Ramadan. I feel good about myself. Oh my God. I mean, I go to high school. I don't, so many of my friends don't even fast on Ramadan. And here I am. I was actually coming to the Masjid for Tahajjud. I mean, who does that in this day and age? Right? It's very easy for you to feel so good about yourself. And quite honestly, we have to acknowledge our success. It is, it is not easy to be righteous in Ramadan, considering the environment in which we live. So if you feel good about yourself, I understand why, I comprehend it. Then you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. But as I always say to my kids, in order for you to continue to rise and ascend and grow and mature, you need to compare yourself not with those who are less than you, but rather with those who are better than you. You know, when my kids say, well, you know, Dad, look at all the other kids at school. I'm like, I don't want to look at the other kids at school. I don't want to. I want to look at people who are better than you. Oh, most kids in my class, you know, they have, you know, C minus and, and, and B minus. So you should be thankful that I have a B plus. I was like, no. You know, I want you to compare yourself with that one kid in your class that has an A plus. Because this is how we grow, right? And I can't think of, of any creation of Allah that we can compare ourselves with than the most pure of all beings. And what is the most pure and most sublime of all of God's creation? The angels, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them from nur, from light. And they don't make mistakes. They don't commit sins. Listen to this hadith. If you are filled with pride now, pride that prevents you from building a good discipline after Ramadan, pride that prevents you from surrendering yourself to Allah's commands without questioning and without trying to find a rationale behind it, Right? If, if that pride is preventing you from growing after Ramadan and from thinking that Ramadan is the first step and you need to continue to go up the staircase, listen to this hadith. Listen to this hadith. The angels, they have every reason to be proud because they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala night and day. لا يفترون, as the Quran said, they never get bored of worshiping Allah. Right? يقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما من موضع أربعة أصابع in the entire universe, there is no space that can occupy four fingers, meaning there is no inch in the universe that is not occupied by an angel that is either in a state of prayer, standing, or making a ruku' or making sujood. In other words, the, the universe around us, you know, every, you know, around you everywhere, every inch in this seemingly empty space that surrounds us, Every inch is occupied by an angel, and this angel is a constant state of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either standing in prayer, or making ruku', bowing, or making sujood, prostrating. حَتَّى إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا سُبْحَانَكْ مَا عَبَدْنَاكَ حَقَّ عِبَادَتِكَ Lord! Endless you are in your glory. That's what the angels are going to say on the Day of Judgment. After, you know, Eons, eons of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will stand before the Lord on the day of judgment and they will say, Lord, endless you are in your glory. We have not offered you our proper acts of devotion. We have not worshipped you enough. We wish we could have done more. And the average person among us, you know, just does a couple of tahajjuds in Ramadan and fasts every day and complains about fasting. And they think that they've achieved something really amazing, right? Your pride after Ramadan is the number one thing that will prevent you from growing. <coughs> from learning the two things. Surrender, taslim, to the commands of Allah without asking any questions. And number two, building a discipline, a moral system that will keep you going. That will keep you going up the stairs for the rest of the year. Right? And the, 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 the way to remove that pride from our hearts and to humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right now is by looking at the angels who are definitely better than us in their acts of worship. And they think that nothing is enough when they, when they offer their devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that some of you will ask me this question. Okay, can you please give us practical advice? What do we need to do after Ramadan in order to keep the momentum going? Because that's all we want, right? We've done, alhamdulillah, relatively well in Ramadan. You know, 
there are people out there that are in so much ghafla, you know, that their heedlessness is so overwhelming that, wallahi, and, I, and I'm telling you this with, you know, with truthfulness. Um, you know, when I, I still go to coffee shops in Ramadan, I don't drink, I don't order anything, but I use their internet, right? And I'm preparing my khatara or whatever, or my khutbah. But, but I do go there and I frequent those places without ordering anything because I'm fasting. And I see, I, I don't want to say a lot, but, but I see quite frequently Muslims, and I know them by name, right? Who go to those places, they go to those establishments, and they order their coffee, and they know that I can see them. And they hold their cup of coffee and they come say salam to me. I'm not even joking. Like some people, when they see the imam over there, number one, they'll think, oh, what is he doing here? It's Ramadan, right? And then number two, they will say, okay, if he's not drinking coffee, then he's fasting. He shouldn't see me drinking coffee. They would just like walk away. But some people, I swear to God, they will bring a cup of coffee, say, salam, imam, uh, Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> I am not even joking. There are some people that are in so much ghafla, they're in so much heedlessness that they, they, don't, they don't see halal, haram, right, and wrong anymore, right? لا يحل حلالا ولا يحرم حراما You know, as the Prophet taught us. Some people, they are so inundated in their own sinful lifestyle. I don't judge them. Wallahi, I'm not saying this by way of judging them. I feel bad for them. And I continue to maintain my positive attitude to them. And I continue to talk to them. You know, hey, I would love to see you at Taraweeh. I know he's not even fasting, but I'm, I'm just like asking him to come to Taraweeh, right? It doesn't matter. You, you never give up hope on people. You don't give up hope, right? But my heart bleeds sometimes when I see people in this state of heedlessness completely. And so when I talk to you, Ahlul Masjid, you know, the people of the Masajid, I don't think that you are heedless. I think that your hearts are filled with light. And I, 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 I know in my heart that you guys are filled with the desire to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why these issues are more threatening to us because we are prone to feel proud after Ramadan. They are not. Because they know that they're so far removed from the path anyway. They don't even care to feel pride or anything like that. But you are more prone and more predisposed to feel proud after Ramadan because you've done well in Ramadan. And that's why it's, it's, a, it's a threat to us. That's why it's dangerous for us. And that's why I need to remind myself and remind you, maintain your humility after Ramadan. Keep your taslim, your surrender and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep your motivation and your moral compass and keep going up the staircase, right? And the way to do this is when we compare ourselves with the angels who constantly worshiping, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nonstop, right? And again, going back to what I was saying, I need to share with you practical advice. And that practical advice is important to you. It's not important to people outside, you know. Those guys, I need to get them to stop drinking coffee in the days of Ramadan you know, as a, as, a, as a good first step. But with you guys, I need to give you a bit of a more meaty advice, if you will, okay? Of all the acts of worship in Ramadan that I want to advise you to consider. See, everything that we do in Ramadan is done one way or the other throughout the year. We fast, yeah, we fast. We fast on Ashura, we fast on the day of Arafah. Many of us fast on Mondays and Thursdays, you know, 13, 14, and 15 of every lunar month. We do fast throughout the year. Maybe not as intensely as Ramadan, but we do experience fast throughout the year. The six days of Shawwal, some of you are probably fasting today. When it comes to Salah, hey, we, we pray every single day, not just in Ramadan. When it comes to charity, we give Sadaqah you know, every single day or every single week, whatever. Not, not necessarily just in Ramadan. We make dhikr you know, every single day. But there is one act of worship that is so unique to Ramadan that I want you to keep it up. That's just the one thing that I really need to remind you of today. And that is Qiyamul Layl. Qiyamul Layl is so unique to Ramadan. I know that some of us would do Qiyam occasionally, and, and it's actually quite rare. But where else throughout the year will you pray 11 rak'ahs or 21 rak'ahs after Isha? Who really does that? Do we do that? We don't do that. When else throughout the year will you literally get up at 2.30 in the morning and come to the masjid at 3 a.m. to stand up for tahajjud? I mean, we don't do that. It's just in Ramadan. The Prophet says in the hadith, this is Sahih, خير الصلاة بعد المكتوبة صلاة الليل. The best prayer, it's better than your Salat al-Sunnah, better than the Nafil, all of that. The best prayer after the mandatory prayer that has been obligated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you is praying at night, Salat al-Layl. Imam al-Hasan al-Basri, 
radiallahu anhu, says, ma alimna min al-ibadati ma huwa ashad min salat al-layl. I don't know of any act of worship that is weightier on the scale in the sight of Allah than praying at night. And then he said, radiallahu anhu, you know, Imam al-Hasan al-Basri about praying at night, that this is the weightier of all acts of worship on the scale. So they asked him, مَا بَالُ أَهْلُ اللَّيْلِ أَبْيَضُ النَّاسِ وُجُوهَا why is it that the people of the night, uh, what, a, what, a, what a characterization, right? Ahlul Layl, the people of the night. Allahumma ja'alna min ahlil layl. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of the night who stand up and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night when everyone is asleep. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Al Hassan al Basri says, when they asked him, why is it that the people of the night have the brightest faces? Why do they have the brightest faces? So he said to them, خَلَوْ بِالرَّحْمَانِ فَشَمِ لَهُمْ بِنُورِهِ They were private with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the night and that's why he infused them with his light. He infused them with his nur. And that's my advice to you, inshallah, you know, as, as we bid farewell to the month of Ramadan. Once a month at least. And wallahi, I'm thinking that maybe this is something that we should organize. Like one Qiyamul Layl for the community, you know, once a month or something like that. And we bring people and we pray two or four rakahs. I think maybe we need to do that on a, on a near regular basis. But if we didn't, then you need to do it at home, right? Once a month, just set the alarm one hour before Fajr and just get up and try to do your salah. Whether you pray Fajr at the masjid regularly or you pray Fajr at home, it doesn't matter. Whether you pray it in jama'ah or you pray it by yourself, it doesn't matter. But once a month, get up early. And if you can't do that, before you go to bed, two rak'ahs that you pray with the niyyah of Qiyamul Layl. Just do it as tahajjud for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of you will say, well, this is so hard. Imam is so difficult. I barely get up for Fajr. How can I get up an hour before Fajr? A man asked Ibrahim ibn Adham, you know, the great scholar of the Tabi'in. He asked him the same question. Ya Imam. It's very difficult for us to get up, you know, to, to pray at night. So Ibrahim ibn Adham responded to them and he says, لا تعصي الله بالنهار فيقيمك بين يديه بالليل Do not commit sins during the day and Allah will establish you before him at night. فإن صلاة الليل شرف لا يعطى للعصاة Praying at night is an honor that is not granted to the sinners. You want to see yourself get up easily at night and pray a couple of rak'ahs and then do your fajr, then refrain as much as possible from committing sins during the day. And again, see, it goes back and it loops back to the discipline of Ramadan. What we do with our lives after Ramadan is over. What we've learned from the month of Ramadan. The type of discipline that we maintain after Ramadan. Going up the staircase, as I said earlier. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of the night and to make us among the people of the Qur'an, and to grant us the strength to maintain the discipline of Ramadan throughout the year. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and speak to Allah Azza wa from the heart. Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijabah. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu bihi wa nastahdihi wa nastaghfiru. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyati a'malina man yahdihi allahu fa huwa al-muhtad. Wa man yudlil falan tajida lahu wa liya murshida. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-mab'uthi rahmata lil'alameen. وقائد الغر الميامين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ورض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters I talked to you today about our journey throughout the year after Ramadan is over. Uh, many of us think that the journey ends with Ramadan, and I say today that the journey begins with Ramadan. Ramadan is the first step that you take up the staircase. You gotta keep going up after Ramadan. You gotta keep ascending after Ramadan. You take Ramadan as a stepping stone and not the finish line. And, and I said that the, there are two things that we need to retain after Ramadan is over, and we learned that from the story of, of Adam السلام, and the garden. Allah prohibiting him from touching the, the, the fruit of that particular tree, right? Number one, 
You do it because you surrender to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without trying to necessarily find, it, find any rationale behind it. Okay? If you found rationale, that's fine. But that is not your intention. That's not what you're after. Okay? Because a lot of people, they will only do it if they find a good reason. So imagine you asking your son or asking your child to do something and then your kid says, well, I'll do it if you convince me that it, this is good for me. Your response will be, can you just do it because I want you to do it? Can you do it out of love for me? Do I have to explain it to you every single time? Can you do it just because your dad who loves you? And this will be a gesture of loving him back and say, okay, you know what, dad, if, if, if that's what you're asking, I'll do it. And I don't even need any explanation. See, that, that has to be your attitude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This surrender in submission, right? The other one is <clears throat> to maintain the discipline of Ramadan throughout the rest of the year in order to keep, again, going up the staircase, as I said earlier. And one of a, sim a simple practical advice that we can practice together after Ramadan is to maintain Salatul Layl, uh, praying at night. Once a month, set your alarm so that you can get up maybe an hour before Fajr and do some Salah and, and just remember the beautiful nights of Ramadan when we stood here together in Tahajjud and people shed the tears of longing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan. Very, very easy to do as long as, as Ibrahim ibn Adham says, as long as you try your best to refrain from committing sins. And we all human, we all make mistakes, but Allah wants to see a determination in your heart, a desire, a plan to avoid things that are haram. I need to end with a story. And in this, this is a story about Amr ibn Qais al-Tamimi. Amr al-Tamimi was you know, Al-Abid Al-Zahid, he is known in his time to be one of the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the stories about his act of, acts of worship were told as tales, right, in, in the Muslim world at the time. So he was traveling in a caravan, and the caravan basically set up camp at night in order to get some sleep, and in the morning they, keep, they get back on the road. And so they noticed that every time they set up camp at night, he leaves the caravan and basically walks into the forest and then comes back, you know, right before Fajr. So one of the guys that was with him in the caravan, he's the one that's telling the story. He says, I decided to follow him this time and see what he's doing when everyone is asleep. So he followed Imam Amr at Tamimi until he basically penetrated the forest, came to a, a little plateau that was empty of trees and, and, and the moon was up and, and it lit it up a little bit. And he stood in the middle of that plateau in the middle of the night and he started praying. He's by himself. And, and, and the, the man that followed him says, I have never seen anyone that prays in more khushur than this man. So he stood there and he continued to stand there observing the Imam praying. And his dua, of course, he thought that he was by himself, right? So he started making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma inni sa'altuka thalathan. Lord, I have asked you three things, and you've granted me two, and you denied me the third one. Allahumma fa'atani thalitha hatta a'budak ma ahayit. Grant me the third one so I continue to worship you as I want for the rest of my life. So the man that followed him ruffled up some branches, you know, without noticing, and Imam Amr felt that was someone was there, you know, looking at him. So he said, who is there? Who is there? And the man revealed his identity. And he said, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't, mean to, uh, I didn't mean to scare you. I didn't mean to startle you. I was just amazed, you know, observing you. And he requested that the imam tell him what are the three things that he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Tell me, what are those three things? I need to learn from you. I need to make, learn how to make dua as well, right? So the imam told him, you know, سَأَلْتُ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ I asked Allah to remove from my heart any possibility of me being seduced by women. He's not asking Allah to remove the desire altogether completely, but he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the fitna so that he's not seduced or tempted beyond his own control. And Allah granted me my prayer. And I asked Allah to remove the fear of men from my heart. Cowardice. And he removed. I, I, I never fear anyone anymore. I asked Allah to remove from my heart the desire to sleep so that I'm able to stand up in prayer every night. 
but Allah did not grant me that. He literally wants Allah to remove from his heart the natural desire, the physical desire of every human being to get some rest every night so that he has more hours with Allah Azza wa I know that some people pray the same thing today. You know, I, I wish I have 28 hours in the day so that I can work more and make more money. But the Imam wanted more hours so that he can spend those hours with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night. There is nothing in this world that will give you the pleasure that Allah grants his closest worshippers from Salatul Layl and Qiyamul Layl and Tahajjud and praying at night, brothers and sisters. Let's make that, inshallah, just at least one of those things that we keep with us throughout the year as we bid farewell to the month of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins to establish us strongly on his path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of the Quran, to make us among the people of the night. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us his mercy, his love and compassion in the life of this world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our hearts, to help us resist evil and temptation. I ask Allah to help us refine our character and to get close to him as we tread on our journey throughout the rest of the year. I ask Allah to grant us so many years to come in which we will experience the beautiful month of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of Ramadan, those who are forgiven in Ramadan, those who are elevated in the month of Ramadan. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the highest level of his Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma laka alhamdu kama yinbaghi li jalali wajhika wa azimi sultanik. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا تقبل منا يا ربنا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم يا ربنا بلغنا رمضان أعواما بعد أعوام واغفر لنا فيه برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم بارك في أخوتنا وجمعنا على قلب أتقى واحد فينا اللهم وحد صفنا وأعلي رايتنا واجمع حولنا القلوب والعقول واجعلنا يا ربنا من عتقائك من النار واجعلنا من المقبولين اللهم منصر إخواننا المصلعفين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم منصرهم على الطغاة اللهم منصرهم على هؤلاء الذين يريدون أن يعبدون من دونك ويريدون أن يطاعون من دونك اللهم يا ربنا انصرهم على عدوهم وثبت الأرض من تحت أقدامهم اللهم واربط على قلوبهم برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوة يا رب العالمين وأقن الصلاة